Crash Team Racing released in 1999 and was the final game that Naughty Dog made using the Crash Bandicoot license. After the release of Crash 3, Naughty Dog knew they were about to lose the license to Crash due to worsening conditions with Universal Studios and decided to make one final game as a passion project. The game they created was Naughty Dog's first attempt at a kart racer, and they created what was damn near a flawless game that even Mario Kart began to take inspiration from almost immediately. However, today the Crash Racing franchise is more likely than not completely dead with Nitro Fueled being the last entry in the series we will ever get to see. As you could probably tell by the title of this video, Crash Racing games went downhill and they did so at a record pace. This video is going to cover all the major installments of the Crash Racing games, but I'm specifically excluding any of the mobile games from this video because I've repressed any and all memory of them, but I also wouldn't even know where to start on playing these games today. That being said, we got a lot of games to get through, so let's go ahead and hop into it with the original Crash Team Racing. Crash Team Racing is my favorite game in the entire series, and it's not even close. You see, Naughty Dog finished up Crash 3, and they hired on quite a few developers and the majority of the studio was sent to work on Naughty Dog's jump to PS2 with the Precursor Legacy. And so for 18 months, around 20 developers stayed behind to work on Crash Team Racing, out of inspiration for games like Mario Kart. And I would go as far to say that this game almost controls better than Mario Kart, and constantly gives you the feeling of really burning rubber against the track, and to this day I don't think any kart racer has been able to compete with the satisfaction that mastering this game's primary mechanic, drift boosting, truly unlocks. I'm not going to get into the super nerdy stuff until we bring up this game's remaster towards the end of the video, but it's worth saying that this game is surprisingly deep and speedruns of this game are fantastic to watch and will completely break your understanding of certain levels in this game. Most view CTR as a spiritual successor to Diddy Kong Racing in that it was one of the few kart racers of its time to feature an adventure mode. The adventure mode is the primary way you get to play CTR as you drive around the hub world where you find different levels to complete and initially earn trophies but also later tokens and relics. And why are we doing this? Well to defeat an alien of course, and this is probably the part where I should explain the story of the game. The story of this game is kind of a throwaway and isn't meant to be taken very seriously. An alien, nitrous oxide from the planet Gasmoxia, has arrived to Earth where he challenges Earth's best drivers to a competition for the fate of the planet. If we win, we get to keep Earth. If we lose, he'll turn it into a giant parking lot, which is an awesome detail. And speaking of awesome details, the bosses in this game aren't actually entirely bad guys. They're just other drivers on Earth who want to compete for the sake of fighting Oxide to save their own planet, which is a pretty awesome detail. Upon creating a new game, we get to choose our character throughout the entire game for the first time in the Crash series. And each of the main characters are grouped into an archetype, meaning that the character you choose actually impacts how you get to play through the game. Crash and Cortex are balanced between all three categories, making it an easy pick for beginners. Engine and Coco are more so focused on acceleration, Tiny and Dingo Dial focus on speed, and Polar and Pura focus on turning. My personal favorite being Dingo just because I love the voice lines, and to this day I almost exclusively play the speed archetype. I'm not going to go through every single level in this game just for the sake of my sanity and the length of this video, but I am going to cover this game's highs and lows. The game opens to our first hub world, Insanity Beach, which is an excellent introduction with a handful of super simple courses, and one of my all-time favorites, Sewer Speedway. Each hub world you enter has four trophies to acquire, and once you've acquired all four, you get introduced to the bosses of each world. The first one we encounter is Ripperoo, who in a delightful design choice is in his trademark straight jacket, and also doesn't speak any English whatsoever, but instead does his iconic screaming that gets subtitled. <laughs> Hey everybody, Dagger from the Future here. While editing this video, I managed to find all of the original Rue talking cutscenes in English, and uh, I had to sit through them, so now you do too. I actually find Rue to be one of the more difficult bosses in this game due to his annoying amount of TNT he can throw out, but also defend himself with. But if you can get ahead of the bosses in this game, you'll usually be able to wrap it up super easily, which is a theme throughout the entire series, believe it or not. After winning the race, we get another cutscene where Rube gives us the key, and we get to move on to World 2, which is the domain of Papu Papu. World 2 is fairly easy, but is home to a couple of challenges, most notably this goddamn fucking purple token challenge, but we'll get into that later. The best track in this world is Papu's Pyramid, and it's by a fucking mile. This level features some of the most insane skips if you have the talent form, but even for casual players it's some of the most memorable shortcuts throughout the entire game. And after another four trophies, we get to fight- oh! Jesus. Him. 
Yeah, there's a super weird glitch exclusive to the PAL region version of this game where if you just press triangle on the language selection screen, a bunch of models just get super fucked up. And also, Uka Uka just gets lobotomized. On to World 3, which is the ice theme part of the game, and for once, the ice world isn't actually the worst part of the game. The two most notable tracks this hub world has to talk about are Polar Pass, which is an insanely great track with tons of opportunities for speed and several unique shortcuts, but also on the complete opposite end, I have to say Tiny Arena is the worst level in the entire game. It has an insanely long lap time with an absolutely painful aesthetic to look at. The boss of this world is Komodo Joe, who's actually kind of a disappointment this far into the game in my opinion being as easy as he is. Fun fact about this boss though, the original idea for this fight was to both have Komodo Joe and Komodo Mo in this fight, and I have no idea if they'd be separate racers or in the same cart, but I'm kind of disappointed they couldn't pull this off. Now we get to move on to Citadel City, which is the highlight of the whole name experience if you ask me. This world does not have a single miss across all four tracks, and I'm not going to go into each individual one, but you know if you've played them. It's also one of the biggest highlights in the series as far as the soundtrack goes. Pinstripe is the boss of this stage and is my favorite boss in the entire game. Pinstripe shoots bombs at you, and if you're behind him, I swear to Christ this man is a fucking sniper. It also doesn't help that his stage, Hot Air Skyway, is extremely narrow at certain points and gives him a hundred opportunities to take perfect shots at you. And once we're through that, we get to move on to the final boss of this game, at least, well, sort of. Oxide's a dirty cheater in this game and speeds off way ahead of you before you can even start, ensuring that he gets all kinds of time to throw bullshit at you. But believe it or not, if you're up for a super cool glitch, this is arguably the easiest boss in the entire game. Oxide Station is home to one of the largest skips that's actually pretty damn easy to do. If you just get a little speed and jump off at this particular spot, you can make the race an absolute joke. But if you do decide to do this legit, this is a damn good race even for an experienced player. After finishing the final boss for the first time, we're introduced to a mechanic that we'll see across the rest of these games in an identical fashion, so I'm just going to explain it once here in the video. There are two main collectibles to focus on, relics and tokens. Tokens are the easier of the two to grab. Most are CTR tokens that allow you to replay the level, but with three letters scattered throughout. And if you can get all three letters and win the race, you get the token. Purple tokens are a crystal collection challenge that are actually pretty fucking difficult and traumatize childhood me. Relics are also a source of trauma for most people, especially the tortured souls who went for the platinums. Relics in this game are pretty familiar to anyone who played Crash 3 or the Insane Trilogy, but uniquely to the racing franchise, breaking all of the yellow time crate boxes you see around the course awards you with a massive time deduction of 10 seconds. This is almost completely necessary for 90% of the Platinum Relics in this game, and the reason for getting them of course is to achieve full game completion and earn a rematch with the final boss for a secret cutscene. I'm not going to go into details with the Relics throughout the rest of this video, just not to retread any points or anything like that but anyone who's gone for these knows exactly how painful they are. And after an identical rematch with Oxide, we get to our final cutscene. Oxide finally decides to fuck off, and we get one of my favorite credit sequences ever, as every character, including the bosses, is shown dancing with the conclusion to their story at the bottom of the screen, which is absolutely great. But as nice as CTR is, it's finally time we move on to the second game in the franchise released on the PS2, Crash Nitro Kart. Crash Nitro Kart released just four years after the original game on the PS2, but if you've ever gone on the internet and looked up a review of this game, most people really don't know how to feel about it. Most people think the game is just okay, but not that great, myself included. The reasoning for this? The massive step down the game takes in controls for no apparent reason. I'm sure you can tell just by how clunky and heavy this looks compared to the original, but you almost have to play both back to back to really understand the downgrade here. I really don't get the reasoning for this change either. I mean, CTR was praised for its extremely tight controls, so why replace it from the ground up with an inferior system that makes it feel less like you're burning rubber but more like you're sliding everywhere? 
The game also introduces an anti-gravity mechanic similar to the one we see in Mario Kart 8 over 10 years later. However, these segments once again feel extremely clunky and I can say with 100% certainty that Mario Kart 8 does this idea way better. Interestingly enough, actually, this game was supposed to be the original introduction for Nina Cortex, who would show up three years later in Twin Sanity, but for unknown reasons, the idea got scrapped. The story of this game is more or less identical to that of CTR, but you know what? I'll actually go against the tide for a minute. I actually kind of prefer the story of Nitro Car over CTR. I mean, think about it. The main antagonist, Velo, is actually somewhat threatening and is voiced by Steve Blum, who you probably recognize as the voice actor of Ares from God of War but also Dempsey from the COD Zombies series. Velo abducts the cast of characters from their homes in one of my favorite introductory cutscenes of all time. Crash is passed out around some of the collectibles from the main games, while Crunch and Aku Aku are talking about fitness and fad diet. I've heard you can lose a lot of weight on it, but you can't keep it off. Just eat less and exercise more. Cortex, on the other hand, is running an experiment once again while Tiny plays checkers against himself. Velo uses one hell of a tractor beam and pulls both the Bandicoot house and a piece of Cortex's castle and brings him to his arena. The word of your racing prowess has reached my glorious empire. <laughs> and I hope you'll put on a good show. Especially since winning the circuit will win your freedom. And if for some reason you refuse to race, your heirs will be destroyed. But I don't think it will come to that. Do you accept my challenge? The plot of this game is that we get to choose to play as either Team Crash or Team Cortex and fight as either good or evil in Free Earth and of course ourselves by racing. I actually really like the idea of choosing a team of characters to play as as opposed to a single character, and it at least at the very minimum makes this game somewhat unique. And also uniquely there are customized endings and cutscenes for both Team Bandicoot and Team Cortex that you see throughout the game. Just like CTR, we have four different hub worlds to drive around, each with its own unique boss. However, now each world only has three tracks as opposed to four, meaning this game only has a total of 13 tracks to play through as opposed to CTR's 18. The tracks in this game are also more often than not just kind of forgettable and I really don't have a lot to say about 90% of these tracks with the exceptions of the bosses. The bosses in this game are actually a substantial improvement to CTRs in that they are now full animated cutscenes with your opponent talking to you out of his cart. And while somewhat insignificant, this actually adds a lot of character to the bosses and our characters to some extent. Also, quick side note, I'm fairly certain that someone slipped Crash a perk because he is constantly screaming in this game. He also overdoses on fentanyl. Before we wrap up this game's story, I think it's a good idea to talk about some of the big changes the game makes that heavily impact its difficulty. In Nitro Kart, you get an additional speed bonus by keeping the turbo as close to the edge as you can possibly get it. There's also a little combo chainer that appears at the top of your screen, and I believe you get more boost the more you chain, I'm not entirely sure. But this new mechanic, alongside the team-up mechanic, which I'm not even going to bother explaining, makes this game a total joke, and I'm rarely ever in danger of losing a single race. Those two things aside, the three tracks I'd like to highlight for this game are Clockwork Wumpa, Out of Time, and Electron Avenue. Clockwork Wumpa feels like a spiritual successor to Cortex Castle in a lot of ways, and has some pretty interesting shortcuts using these gears. Out of Time is a pretty interesting track, with nothing particularly insane, but I absolutely love the clock segment, which is also present in the hub world. And Electron Avenue might be my favorite level in the entire game. I mean, a fantastic soundtrack, cool obstacles, and a futuristic city aesthetic? Yeah, no complaints here. Although speaking of complaints, I do have one about this game's track length. Many of the levels are consistently far bigger than they were in CTR, with tons of them rivaling Oxide Station and Tiny Arena in lap times. Weirdly enough, this kind of made my fingers tight at a few points, but that's just a small nitpick. Anyway, moving on to the final boss with Velo. I'm not gonna lie, this one actually gave me a tiny bit of trouble and I was fully reliant on the shortcut to win the race. It also doesn't help that Velo has completely homing bombs that are enough to break a few of my controllers. After beating him once, we're right back to a collectathon, as you're once again required to get all the tokens and all the relics, and then beat him one more time, leading to an awful final cutscene. Apparently Velo was one of the small creatures we see in the stands throughout the game in a mech suit, giving them the appearance of the Velo we see. A plot twist that Jack 3 would copy just a year later. And with that, the game is over, and whew. I gotta be honest, now that I'm done with it, I almost like it far less than before I started, which is something I find all the time with this game. Anytime I think it sounds fun, I just kinda replay it and it reminds me about how fucking terrible the controls are. 
Technically speaking, before we move on, we have to briefly cover the GBA version of this game, which isn't exactly a port, but it's also sort of a port, I don't know. Now, I find this game to be okay for a portable racing game, but I am absolutely appalled about how terrible this game's control scheme is. So in this version of Nitro Kart, whenever you want a drift boost, you need to hold the R button and then completely let off of the accelerator because that's what you're going to use to time the drift boost. What the fuck is that? Why even do it at all? There are enough buttons to do this with successfully and recreate the original game's control scheme. The levels in this game also share names with the ones they have on the console version. However, they're completely unrecognizable. The biggest differences you'll see from track to track in this game are things like a small jump or fan blades. The question I always ask myself regarding this game is why? Why does the control scheme suck so much ass? Why do they make a port of a game they can't properly emulate? Why am I even playing this? I personally don't even get why they bothered making this game. I mean, look at the console version compared to this. The levels from the console game are here, but they're just bland. They're not even proper recreations. Why not just take the assets you've created and make your own original game so you can have different marketing as opposed to a game that nobody knows about on a GBA? Okay, okay, I'm, I'm done ranting. On to the next game. <sighs> okay, you know, it's, it's fine, it's fine. Crash Tag Team Racing. Where the fuck do you even start to explain a game like this? I would argue that it's not even really a racing game, it's more of a hybrid between a mediocre collectathon and a terrible racing game. But weirdly enough, I can't help but sort of love the game despite its horrible mechanics, miserable story and frame rate. I mean, the story of the game is as follows. Crash and Cortex are committing war crimes on public roads, and then they fly into an amusement park where we're introduced to a plethora of important characters. Firstly, Chicken Stew, which I'm sure most of you recognize from Nitro Fuel, but this is where they originally came from, and they might be my favorite part of the entire game. Too gruesome for this reporter to describe over the air. Well, I ain't got a problem with it. Man, you ever put a big ham in a wood chipper? I know I have. We get introduced to the rest of the characters after a quick tutorial, and if you haven't picked up on it yet, there is a lot of platforming in this game. After going up an elevator, we get introduced to an eldritch horror by the name of... <clears throat> Willy Wumpa Cheeks, who is fucking horrifying. We are also introduced to Ebenezer Von Clutch, who is the owner of the park which we stumbled into. Cortex wants to build an evil base here, and just to be a dick, we decide to stop him. The black power gem that Von Clutch needs to survive has been stolen, and whoever can find it first gets ownership of the park. And with that, you're set off into the amusement park, which is where this game really tends to shine. A majority of the game is just spent exploring these different themed segments of the world. You have a pirate stage, a fairy tale themed world, a prehistoric section, an Egyptian level, and a space themed stage. And I think just exploring these is where the game is at its best. Another bit of praise I do have to give the game is in its dioramas, hidden around the world that you interact with, where they give you a funny, in quotation marks, cutscene, where you get to either watch a crash commit a war crime or get brutally mutilated, which both work for me. The thing with tag team racing is that it never really takes itself very seriously and it constantly aims to be funny continuing kind of off the style that Twin Sanity set. And to be completely honest with you, I can kind of appreciate the style of storytelling and lightheartedness. However, that's probably all the praise you'll hear me say for this game, because unfortunately, in terms of being a racer, this is the worst fucking game I have ever played. You remember that really cool drifting mechanic? Well, they decided to remove it completely and replace it with this fucking ear ape shit. And the mechanic that tears it all down, even outside of the drifting being removed, is that you don't even have to do the racing in the racing segments. By just pressing triangle, you can get an easy mode victory by just sitting on top of the guns and picking off a couple of people by holding X. This is as simple as it gets and it really is fucking brain dead. But to be quite honest with you, the racing mechanics are so shit that you might as well just sit up on top of the guns. It's a lose-lose scenario. It is at least slightly fun getting to violate the Geneva Convention as you throw live animals and submarines at your opponents. But like I said, the platforming is where you're going to have most of the fun in this game. And there's even stuff that you can do to impact yourself in the races themselves. For starters, you can unlock different characters to start the race as, to have different gun combinations and all kinds of stuff. You can also unlock different shortcuts outside the level themselves, which is a really, really interesting detail that I haven't seen any kart racer attempt ever since. Okay, how did that make- and yeah, I forgot to mention it, but this is actually the first Crash game that would allow you to bring your own skin into each race, a feature that was later brought back for Nitro Fuel. But back to the story to finish this game out. 
In short, everyone thinks that Crash was the culprit behind the missing black gems despite never being here, which enrages the culprit, Willy Wumpa Cheeks, into a baffled rage where he admits to doing it and hauls ass to the final area of the game. Crunch breaks into the rocket and attempts to interrogate him before Je Jesus! Holy shit, I know this game's 10 and up and all, but damn they pushed that label as far as humanly possible. After ending someone's life, Cortex attempts to gun down the bandicoots, but unfortunately for him, Crash has a real, live chicken, which he murders by throwing into the turbine, causing Cortex, Nina, and Engine to crash and fly away. Crash accidentally discovers the Black Power Gem by consuming the remains of the recently deceased person we just killed, and Von Clutch is saved just like that. Until Crash hits him on the back, potentially killing him, and then Crash flees the scene as a wanted criminal, credits roll. What a ride this game is, man. It always kind of feels like a fever dream and I never really know how to feel about it, but what I can say with certainty is that I actually kind of remember it fondly these days. So I guess we're kind of moving on with a weirdly positive sentiment for a game that's just kind of mediocre. You yes, I'm coming, okay? Okay! And don't even think about calling in get here. Starting right now. I said I'm coming! Well, sports fans, it appears we found our Dunkers. Well, sports fans, hot, dig it and dump. This place is magnificent. What is the meaning of this? For a moment there, I think all is lost for Von Clutch, but. And I see my favorite video heroes, my innards tingle with joy. Listen to me, it's time for you to listen to me. <laughs> I need more races to recover my power gems. Whoever is first to bring all the power gems wins the ownership of my bark. Now. Did you even hear what I said? So, if I win, you'll hand over the deed to this amusement enterprise? No questions asked? Perhaps a riddle or two! Holy crap! You are creepy as shit. Okay, Von Clutch, we're in. <laughs> Some sinister force is upstaging my evil plan. I'm beginning to deduce what's going on around here. What is it? Mm. <laughs> it's you! Oh, that's it. I have had it. You people are dumber than a sack of hammers. It's me. Me, I tell you. <laughs> so long. Oh. <laughs> Let Come me on, don't in. do this to me. I'm just getting started. Oh man, you feel thirsty. <laughs> she is a vampire bat. And to the victors go the spoils. You're goddamn right. And finally we arrive at what most people probably consider to be the highlight of the whole series. Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. Objectively, this is probably the best game in the entire series, and it's not even close. This is a very, very close recreation of CTR with gorgeous graphics, but they even toss in some bits from Nitro Kart without the anti-gravity. The character selection in this game also makes any other game in the entire series look completely pitiful, and they even introduce the cosmetic skins just like Tag Team Racing. But let me be real for a tiny little bit. There is something about this game that throws me off completely, and I can't really place my finger on it. 
I felt this way about the game for almost four years now, and I think it might be that the jump has changed a little bit, or maybe you can maintain boost for longer, but this game feels way faster than the original title, and I swear to god some of the time trial relics are way harder just because of this. I'm not sure if most people really notice this, or if it's just me just because of the amount of hours I put into the original, but this really impacts the way I play the game. If any of you in the comments know exactly what the difference is, please let me know. I've been curious about this, well, since the game launched. But even with my nitpick, I really can't hate this game at all. I mean, there's just so many positive things to say about it. This is my current standard for a remake these days. The original title is still here, but it no longer has to sacrifice the visuals for the performance that it used to. The cutscenes have been completely enhanced and the boss is no longer just sitting in his car talking to you and now will actually have fully animated cutscenes. The new drift bar is a simple but excellent change and no longer makes it a complete guessing game on how close you are, and thankfully the masks no longer have a thousand yard stare. However, there are also a few nitpicks I have left to bitch about, so I'm gonna rant for a minute. First off, who in the actual fuck was left in charge of the opening cutscene for the game? I mean, what the fuck happened here? No more ominous music, Oxide sounds like he was dropped on his head at a young age, and, and who the fuck is this guy, man? This voice actor fucking sucks. I could do a better impression of this. Speaking of voice acting, who the fuck decided this was a good voice for Uka Uka? I'm over here stroking my dick, I got lotion on my dick right now, I'm just- You remember that really cool character selection screen that they had in the original game? Well, it's just not here now. No real explanation either, it's just not here. And where to some extent I really do miss that selection screen, they completely make up for it by adding visibly distinguishable different types of boost flames. Whereas in the old game there were just three different types of flames, smaller red flames, big red flames, and then really big red flames, we now have bigger blue flames, bigger red flames, and smaller red flames. This doesn't really do a whole lot for experienced players, but it makes it an easier learning experience for players who don't know the maps inside and out. The story mode for Nitro Fueled is basically more or less the exact same as it was in the original, but in a slightly lame decision they decided to port all the tracks from Nitro Kart, but refused to bring over its adventure mode. And admittedly there's not really a whole lot I can say about this game that I didn't already mention in the original CTR segment, so instead of just repeating all that, how about we just talk about the game's abysmal multiplayer. The online play today is almost completely and entirely dead, and for damn good reason. I have no clue why other people really don't care for it much, but I'll clue you into why I have such an issue with it. The rebounding mechanic that allows you to get better power-ups for being in the last place isn't a bad addition when playing against CPU, but when in an online setting, this is maddening. Getting absolutely ass blasted by the dude in last place just because he's playing poorly is infuriating and makes it completely unplayable for anyone who's taking the game somewhat seriously, which to be fair isn't really the intention. I can promise you that the multiplayer would still be very much so alive today if they just removed this rebounding mechanic and made a competitive mode where people who have the highest skill can stay in first without any risk of getting blasted by those in last. The other big difference between the original game and the remaster that I'd like to talk about are the original tracks that were added after the game's launch. Special mention must go to Nita's Nightmare and Mega Mix Mania for being almost entirely built for the sake of maintaining blue flame across all three laps. So all in all, the Crash Racing franchise certainly had its highs and lows and descended the mediocrity a lot faster than most people probably would have anticipated. To be completely honest with you all, I'd almost prefer the series to die with Nitro Fuel just to keep some semblance of dignity maintained with the series' name. Going back through all these games certainly scratched a nostalgic itch I'd been having for quite some time now, and for those of you who are curious, here's my ranking of each of these games. So thank you all for watching this, um, this is probably going to be the first video I upload to this channel, so a like and a sub would be super helpful, or just letting me know what I did good, what I did bad, if you want to see more of this kind of stuff. I got a few other videos planned, but as it stands right now, I am probably, noticeably, super sick, and my voice is excessively nasally. So that should be all sorted by the time I get, you know, enough free time to record the next video. Um, that little rambling aside, I hope you all appreciated the video, man. I'll see you guys in the next one.